Hello, and welcome to our live telephone town hall meeting. Thanks so much for joining us. We're dialing out to Pennsylvania's 7th Congressional District, and we have your Congresswoman Susan Wild here on the line. She's got some updates for you, and she's assembled a panel of expert guest speakers that are going to be able to give you some updates and also to answer your questions. So we'll hear updates from them in just a moment here, as well as from Congresswoman Wild, and then we'll be going into Q&A. If you think of a question at any time, or in fact, if you have a question on your mind right now, go ahead and press zero on your phone, and we'll get you to an operator, and you can give them your question. Then you'll have the opportunity to ask your question live, or if it's more comfortable for you, you can just let your operator know that you'd like me to read your question instead. Whatever's better for you, uh, we're happy to read it, or we're happy to hear you come live and ask your question live with Congresswoman Wild. So again, welcome to our live forum. You can press zero to submit a question. I see a number of you dialed in on our inbound participant line. Thanks for being prompt and on time for this forum. We're dialing out to tens of thousands of your neighbors right now. We'll have everybody on the line in just a moment from Pennsylvania 7th Congressional District. For those of you just joining us, we have a panel of expert guest speakers here to answer your questions and to give you important updates. So you may even grab a pen and paper just to write down any important information that you hear. And if you have a question for Q&A, we'll be getting to that in about 15 minutes here after we hear some updates from all of our guests and from Congresswoman Wild. We'll be gladly taking your questions for a majority of this one-hour forum. So if you have a question to submit, press zero, speak to an operator, give them your question. And then if you're not comfortable asking your question live in the forum, just let your operator know that when you press zero, and I'm happy to read your question for you. Another opportunity you have tonight is if you'd like to get email updates from Congresswoman Wild moving forward, you can press seven on your phone. Speak to an operator, give them your email address, and we'll gladly keep you better updated electronically moving forward. So uh, we'd like to provide you accurate information as quickly as possible. The best way for us to do that is for you to press seven, give us your email address, and Congresswoman Wild can start sending you updates as we move through this process. So seven for email updates and zero if you have a question. I'm gonna go through this one more time real quick. We're just about through our dial out. Thank you everybody who's joining us from Pennsylvania 7th Congressional District. We have your Congresswoman Susan Wild on the phone and she's assembled a panel of expert guest speakers who are here to answer your questions and also to give you updates. So as you're listening to our expert guests, be thinking about questions you'd like to submit. Press zero if you have a question to submit and we'll take your questions live. Unless you're not comfortable asking them live, then just let your operator know that you want me to read them instead. Happy to do that. So zero for questions. And once more, if you'd like to get email updates from Congress Congresswoman Wild's office, happy to do that as well. It's the best way for us to keep you updated as we move through this process and get you accurate, updated information as quickly as possible. So press seven on your phone to give us your email address and get email updates. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Zero for questions, seven for email updates. And it's my pleasure to kick off this live teletown hall by turning it over to your Congresswoman, Susan Wild. Go ahead, please, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, Ian, um, for that introduction. Good evening, everyone. This is Congresswoman Susan Wild, and I want to thank you for joining tonight's telephone town hall. I know how difficult this time has been on everyone because I'm hearing from all of you on a daily basis with a multitude of questions. So I'm glad we're doing this telephone town hall with some experts on the line who will be able to help us answer those questions. Whether you've been furloughed or laid off, uh, whether you're a frontline worker or you're separated from your family members, you're trying to work from home and balance childcare or any other disruption, I want to say that we at the state, local, and federal level are here for you, and we're working for you. It's an uncertain time for everyone, and we're all in this together. Tonight, I am pleased to be joined by Pennsylvania Labor and Industry Secretary Jerry Alexiak, as well as Unemployment Compensation Benefits Director Susan Dickinson and Dr. Amy Slanker, an infectious disease expert and physician at Lehigh Valley Health Network. They will help answer your questions in regard to the state and local coronavirus response, as well as guidance from the medical community. I, of course, am on the line to answer questions that have to do with the federal response. Coronavirus concerns are in no way a political or partisan issue. Every single day I am talking to constituents, local and state leaders, our health networks, our small business leaders, our nonprofit directors and our emergency responders because their voices and your voices are the ones that will affect my work in Washington, both in the short term 
and in the long-term recovery from this crisis. The stimulus packages that we have passed at the federal level are a reflection of the voices of people just like you here in Pennsylvania 7. These bipartisan packages dramatically increase unemployment insurance so that the loss of a job does not mean the loss of income. Um, the bipartisan packages also provide for direct payments to individuals, um, and those are called economic impact payments. And um, it, they, the packages also expand food assistance programs and fund resources to support our health care providers and small businesses. I am the first to say that this legislation is not perfect and the rollout has not been seamless. Um, it is a compromise that will support countless Pennsylvanians nonetheless. Just yesterday, the first stimulus checks started hitting bank accounts, actually maybe it was a little earlier than yesterday from what I was seeing on Facebook and other social media. There are more phases coming of the rollout, but I'm very, very glad to see the process begin. Um, I was proud to have two pieces of legislation that were included in the final stimulus package, the CARES Act, that were signed into law by the president. The first is the Combating Hunger for Older Americans During Coronavirus Crisis Act. And basically that piece of the bill helps to ensure that older individuals and individuals with disabilities are able to receive the meals that they might typically receive in group settings like a senior center through delivery throughout this pandemic. And, this, and basically what that does is it shifts funding from those group settings to delivery services so that we can make sure that more people are able to be served meals um, by delivery uh, during this crisis. My second bill is the Home Health Care Planning Improvement Act, which allows Medicare beneficiaries to get fast and flexible care where and when they need it. It enables Medicare beneficiaries to receive orders for home health care, not just from a physician, but also from allied healthcare professionals like physicians assistants and nurse practitioners. And that is a change to the law, which at before um, only allowed a physician to order home health care. Some other specifics of the CARES Act include a $150 billion state and local coronavirus relief fund to provide states and localities additional resources to cope with the coronavirus pandemic. Approximately $5 billion of this money will come right back to us in Pennsylvania. There is also $260 billion in dramatically expanded unemployment benefits, including providing an additional $600 per week for the first four weeks after passage, providing an additional 13 weeks of federally funded benefits, and expanding eligibility to include workers in the gig economy and self-employed workers, which previously was not available under the unemployment system. The CARES Act also provides immediate direct cash payments. Those are the economic impact payments I just referred to, to lower and middle income Americans, providing for immediate direct cash payments to those people of $1,200 for each adult and $500 for each child. These payments started rolling out recently, and that process will continue in waves over the next few weeks. Some of you may have already seen those payments hit your bank account if you had direct deposit um, registered with the IRS. The CARES Act also provides for more than $375 billion in small business relief. We'll talk more about that during this town hall and nearly $200 billion for our hospitals, healthcare workers, and health research, which of course is very much needed during this um, health crisis. It's safe to say that this pandemic has affected nearly every aspect of life for people right here in Pennsylvania 7. I am very concerned about everything from people's mental health to personal protective equipment for our frontline workers to childcare issues that are confronting um, people who are in need of child care and the future of child care here in our district. And I'm actively working every single day to ease the burdens that this crisis is putting on our community. 
My website is being updated regularly with answers to your questions and with new resources. I invite you to visit wild.house.gov to see those answers and the new resources as we add them on a regular basis. We are here to help. Um, I have a, an excellent team that wants to work with you both here in Pennsylvania 7 as well as in Washington. We want to hear your stories and we stand with you as we all work to get through this with an evidence-based and measured response together. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Alexiak to give a brief introduction of his work leading Pennsylvania's Department of Labor and Industry at this unprecedented time. With that, Secretary, I invite you to give your opening remarks. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you and, and your constituents this evening. Um, I, I'd like to put this in, in some perspective before we start. In the, in the three weeks before the mitigation efforts began and the coronavirus really hit Pennsylvania, um, our uh, uh, Unemployment Compensation uh, Bureau had a total of 40,000 new claims in those three weeks. In less than three weeks after the mitigation efforts began, we had over a million. And as of today, since March 15th, we're now at 1.4 million new unemployment compensation claims. So the system, to say the system has been overwhelmed is, is a, uh, an understatement. Uh, even with that, we have made uh, more than 2 million payments to our fellow citizens that have totaled over $800 million. So we have, have uh, even with the situation that we're facing, we have been working diligently to make sure that our uh, citizens get the benefits to which they are entitled. Uh, we have, um, most of our staff, uh, we're a large agency, we have 4,000 uh, people, so we are a responsible employer, and most of our folks are working from home, given the uh, uh, shutdown of the Capitol complex and some of the offices around the state. Um, they are um, doing all they can to answer phones, uh, respond to emails, and to make sure that uh, those benefits get out. We have brought back uh, retirees to work with us. We have um, moved people from other agencies to help with this. We've uh, upgraded our technology. Uh, Watson, some of you may be familiar with, uh, an IBM technology that um, has answered more than 30,000 questions for uh, folks. We have, uh, are in the process of hiring 100 more uh, intake interviewers, the folks that uh, talk to people at the start. Um, we realize that there are people who are frustrated, that there are a lot of people, given all those numbers, that are having trouble getting their claims uh, processed. That's, that's frustrating for us as well. We are, we are in the business of, of helping people. I, I've said since I started at Labor and Industry that it's important to me that we follow the rules and regulations. and make sure we balance our budget and all those things. But it's even more important to me that we remember that there are real people at the end of the process. There are people, particularly now, as, as the Congresswoman indicated, these are just challenging times for all of us. Uh, it, it affects our, our families as well. I, it has certainly impacted my family. Uh, so we, we know that the, the people who are receiving these benefits are our, our friends, our relatives, our, our neighbors, our families and we want to do all we can to help them. Uh, there has been a lot of help from the federal government under the CARES Act, and uh, there are three different big pieces to that that the Congresswoman mentioned. One that uh, extends the benefits for an, an additional 13 weeks. Uh, another that adds $600 to the weekly payment. So for those of you who are already receiving unemployment benefits, there is an additional $600 that um, just uh, started this, this week to uh, show up uh, with people's checks, and, and Susan can talk about that a little more. And the last piece, and this is something new, is uh, the PUA program, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Uh, this provides benefits to people who have traditionally not been eligible for unemployment compensation benefits, primarily those who are self-employed, those who get a 1099 and not a W-2, uh, gig workers, uh, Uber, Lyft, things like that, food deliveries. Um, these are, are, are people who don't traditionally get unemployment, but um, with, through the CARES Act will be able to. One of the things that has held that up for us a little bit is that um, the uh, regulation would not allow us to use our standard system that we have for people who are getting those benefits. So we 
basically had to create a new system, and we have worked with uh, our IT people who have done a great job and uh, uh, vendors that we work with that are helping us create that system for people who are um, going to be eligible under that program. Uh, we hope to have that up and running early next week for our applications and money uh, by the middle of May on that. So we are very busy. We're doing a lot. Uh, we are, uh, uh, as I said, very concerned about those of you who are still uh, struggling to get through to us, and we are doing all we can to be more accessible and uh, to meet the needs of our fellow citizens. And with that, uh, Congresswoman, I'd, I'd like to ask Susan to give a little introduction as well. Thank you so much, Secretary. And uh, let's hear from Director of Unemployment Compensation Benefits, Susan Dickinson, now. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, what I want to give you is a little bit more detailed information on the unemployment program in general and also the components of the CARES Act um, that Secretary Alexiak just mentioned. Uh, for starters, the, one of the, the biggest questions we get is what's the best way to file a claim? Um, and if you are one of the people who does have internet access, uh, that is definitely the best way to file a claim. Our website is www dot uc dot pa dot gov and for those people who do not have internet access um, we do have a phone line that's open monday through friday eight to four it is pretty busy um, but i will tell you the secret is to call later in the week mondays and tuesdays are extremely busy and very difficult to get through um, we actually do have a, a staff member who tries five times an hour to call um, every hour, every day, just to make, just to see what the, the volume's like and if people can get through. And she was getting through today. Um, and again, it's, it's Thursday, so usually call volume is much better later in the week. Um, anyway, the phone number is 888-313-7284. And also I want to mention for people who uh, do not have internet access, uh, Jerry had, had mentioned the IBM Watson phone number that we're using. Um, Watson, you know, is an artificial intelligence machine and will answer questions, uh, just like your Alexa. And we've we've named her Paula, so <laughs> I'll give you the number, and if you call, she'll introduce herself as Paula, the unemployment compensation assistant. Um, and, and what she really is, you know, on our website, we have so much information about unemployment compensation and you know so many good things to direct people in the in the right way and a lot of frequently asked questions um, but of course people who can't access it don't have that same advantage so now we have paula to answer your frequently asked questions her phone number is 877-978-1295 so some of the um, recent issues that have been on people's minds are you know receiving after you open a claim uh, receiving the information for your claim in the mail one of the very first things we send you is your pin number so that you can file for biweekly benefits and also your determination that says how much money you get per week so happily as of last weekend we're all caught up on mailing the pin numbers so anyone who who files a claim as of this weekend moving forward will get them within the standard five days or so um, and we are are working on very hard on getting the determinations out. So we're we're ca catching up on those a little bit. Um, so if you haven't received your determination yet, it should be coming in the mail any day. Uh, we're in better shape because our mail rooms added some capacity. They've added some additional shifts. Um, so we're we're doing well in that regard. Uh, some of the things that people have contacted us for, and they're worried because they didn't receive a PIN or, or a determination, uh, we do have a lot of errors on claims that we have to fix manually. And some of those, for example, are just people's basic information. Um, to make sure that your claim goes through well, you wanna make sure that the information about you matches what's on your social security card. Uh, we've had you know, some individuals maybe reverse the numbers of their social security number accidentally or they may have reversed their first name and last name. And it may sound silly, uh, but those things will actually stop your claim because we, we, 
check every claim real time with the Social Security Administration. So uh, we are working through those. So if you're one of those individuals who hasn't received a PIN, that could be why. Um, you know, there's other in instances where something may have occurred, such as you're self-employed. Uh, we have a check in the system that says, hey, if this person's home address is the same as their business address, that's a red flag. Uh, so those are also something that we manually have to look at, and we're going through as quickly as we can, um, getting more help. Uh, as Secretary Alexiak mentioned, we have retirees that started this past Monday. Uh, my 76-year-old mother is one of them. She retired seven years ago, and, and she's pitching in and helping us, too. Uh, we're getting as much help as we possibly can to go through these types of issues. Um, so I'll move on and mention the CARES Act real quick. Um, the FPUC program is the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, and that's the extra $600 on top of unemployment payments. That began with week ending April 4th, um, and it, it gets paid for everybody at the end of the week. So if you're used to filing early in the week on Sunday and getting your payments by Wednesday, and you don't have your FPUC payment, it's not a problem. It's the, re the reason is because we submit them for everybody on Thursday night. So you will see it. It'll, it'll end up where if you keep filing biweekly, you're going to receive a payment every week. So you'll receive your uh, separate, separately your um, regular unemployment payments, and then about a week later, your two FPU C payments. Um, so you should expect a payment then about every week. The PEUC program is an extension of 13 weeks of anyone who is near the end of their unemployment claim um, or has exhausted their unemployment claim in the last um, year or so. So what we're doing now, that guidance just came out from the Department of Labor about six days ago. Uh, we have a system that we used 10 years ago to issue payments on a similar program um, but there are differences, so we have to kind of polish up the old program, get it ready to go, and then we will be ready to reach out and tell everyone what they need to do, if anything, uh, to file for those benefits and, and receive those extra 13 weeks. Um, and finally, the PUA program, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, that is a program that is kind of the catch-all for anyone who does not qualify for regular UC benefits. As long as you're attached to the workforce in some way, uh, the PUA program could be where you receive benefits. So this is, of course, a lot, all of the self-employed individuals, uh, any type of the gig workers who, you know, maybe like Uber drivers, things like that. Um, so the, the PUA program, we're testing now. We're using a third party for that system. Uh, we're testing it, and we hope to have at least the application portion of it up soon. Um, and then a couple weeks later, the payment portion, you know, the ongoing claims, that part will be ready then as well. Um, and so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Congressman Wiles. Thank you so much, Susan Dickinson, from the, as the Director of UC Benefits in Pennsylvania. That was um, an intro that was chock full of good information, and I'm sure some will repeat some of it later in this program. Finally, I would like to invite Lehigh Valley Health Network uh, uh, Dr. Amy Slinker to give us an update from our incredible frontline healthcare workers. Um, Dr. Slinker, take it away. And by the way, before you speak, I just want to introduce you as a member of the infectious disease team at Lehigh Valley Hospital. Um, and so you, you are very, very qualified to um, give us this update. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Congresswoman. So um, just a brief update from the healthcare worker perspective. So in Pennsylvania, as of today, we have 27,735 cases reported in our state. And in Lehigh County, uh, almost 2,000 positive cases reported and 28 deaths so far. But I'd like to report good news. Um, in our state and in our local county as well, the cases are plateauing, and we've seen a consistent plateau of new cases and patients in the hospital for about five days now. Um, so the message I'd like to bring to the community is that social distancing is working. All these measures that we've been carefully implementing are showing an effect and is, you know, really working for the community. 
In general, uh, healthcare workers are in good spirits now. We appreciate all the support we've received from the community. We're working during a really difficult time, but um, everything that you guys have done for us has been helpful. Our stable supply of PPE is, is really reassuring right now. We continue to accept donations from the community, um, and we would gladly take more if you guys have. And uh, our testing capabilities have also improved dramatically in the past few weeks. So um, all these things are really coming together, and I think that is showing in the numbers that we are now showing around the state um, that you know new infections are sort of leveling off. So my really important message right now to everyone on the phone is if you don't feel well, please stay home. Um, most people who get sick with this infection, almost 80% can be managed successfully just by staying home and taking care of yourself, resting, drinking plenty of fluids. Um, if you do feel sick, uh, the first thing that you should do is um, visit LVHN.org and you can immediately receive advice on what to do next. Um, and so a lot of people, if you, if you do need to see care, we can get you on the phone right away with a nurse or through an electronic visit. So you may not have to come in and be potentially exposed on your way in to seek medical care through the hospital. And I'll turn it back over to you, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, Dr. Slinker, and thank you all for joining me tonight to answer these vital questions that my constituents have. I'm very, very proud and happy that I'm able to provide your expertise in answering their questions and as a resource for them. So with that, Ian, let's get to the questions. Gladly. Thank you, Congresswoman Weil, and thanks to everybody who's joined us on this live forum. A uh, quick reminder before we take our first live question, you can press 7 to get email updates from the Congresswoman's office. We'd love to keep you as updated as possible as we move through this process, and we can do it quickly and effectively by email. So if you press 7, Give us your email address. Congressman Wild will keep you updated electronically moving forward. Let's get our next, our first question in from Jennifer in Easton. Jennifer, thanks so much for waiting. You're our first live caller. Go ahead with your question for Congresswoman Wild, please. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. The company I work for in Bethlehem closed voluntarily on the 17th with the understanding that we were to flatten the curve um, so that uh, life could restart. Um, with the cases plateauing, um, why can't we open with social distancing and PPE, considering that there was a vote to open PA and the governor vetoed it? What is the plan to open Pennsylvania? So, Jennifer, this is Congresswoman Wild, and I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to toss it over to Dr. Slinker. Um, but I, I understand the frustration. I, I hear from so many people that want to know why we are not reopening more quickly. Um, and I, I really, speaking for myself, and I'm, I'm going to let Dr. Slinker voice any medical opinions, I think it's really important that we be driven by data and not by date when it comes to reopening our economy. Um, there's been an awful lot of misinformation about what reopening the government will look like, what businesses are, are or are not essential. And I'm glad you're on this call, and I'm glad you asked that question, because I hope we can clear up some of the confusion. We do know, and I'm again, I'll defer to Dr. Slinker, but we know that if we go back to business as usual right now, all signs point to massive levels of infection. Uh, that's not good for the economy, but more than more important, it's not good for us as human beings or for our families um, who would grieve. So it's not an either or situation. And the last thing that I'm just going to say on this before I pass it over is that we really need to focus on the fact that the reality when we reopen is that our day to day lives might look much different than we are accustomed to until a time when we have a vaccine. We may reopen um, on a gradual or otherwise basis um, and find that our restaurants have limited capacities, that our schools have um, a different appearance to them, that our workplaces may require uh, 
uh, personal protective equipment and that kind of thing, masks and so forth. So I just think it's really important that we do everything we can to ensure the health and safety of Pennsylvanians by listening to the scientists and medical professionals who do this work every day. And with that, I am going to toss it over to Dr. Slinker to comment further on that question. Thanks, Jennifer. Yep. Yeah, thank you for a great question, Jennifer. Um, so, so as I said, it, we are seeing cases plateau. Um, and so it is very reassuring to show that what we're doing is working. Uh, but I agree that we need to follow the numbers, and it's it's very premature right now to say that we can completely sort of start to open up and, and go back to business as usual. Uh, we do know that the incubation period for this particular infection can be as long as 14 days. So that means that someone can have no symptoms after being exposed but still get sick about two weeks after exposure. Um, so that's really important to factor into our thinking here. We're going to need to have a prolonged period where we're really not seeing any new infections before we can even start to sort of do a slow opening back up to where things were before. And we need to be very cautious. So we need to have a very good system in place for monitoring if any new infections start arising and then quickly sort of ramp it back down a little bit. So I think it's going to be a slow start and stop as we start to open up um, and come back to where we were before. Um, knowing that if we overwhelm the health system moving forward, we could have a very high mortality rate and lose many more people than we need to. Uh, Dr. Slinker, it's, Susan, it's Congresswoman Wild again. Um, could you just comment on the role of testing and the importance of testing uh, before we reopen? Yes. Yeah, so testing and our capability it's super important before we start to reopen because once we know someone who's infected we can very quickly isolate that patient and then do a contact investigation to find out who that patient has been exposed to and then also make sure that those contacts are in a home quarantine situation so as our testing capabilities improve we have a lot more capability to find people who have the illness and isolate them. And that's going to be huge for moving back to the way things were before. There are new forms of testing that are starting to come online now where we can do a blood test and look to see if someone was exposed to the virus in the past. That is really novel um, for this infection, and we're not totally sure how we're going to use, use that information moving forward, um, but that'll somehow play into this as well. Thanks, Dr. Slanker. Ian, you want to give us our next question? Sure thing, Congresswoman. We've got one coming here from Lynn and Emmys. Hi, Lynn, you're live. Go ahead. Well, this is perfect timing for my question. Um, so testing for active infection was rolled out, I guess we could say, slowly and haphazardly. And we know that when antibody testing becomes available, it's going to need to be abundant readily accessible, covered by insurance, or free. And we don't know a whole lot. It doesn't seem that we know a whole lot about the antibodies yet. Dr. Fauci says that maybe they'll be effective for a month, two months, a season, a year. And my question was really to Dr. Slanker, how, how do you figure that out? So is it um, just serial serum testing subject? in real time, or is there a way that that's expedited to figure to figure that out? Yes, yeah, so the, the way that historically we've figured out about if antibodies that are produced after a specific virus actually are neutralizing antibodies, meaning that they will protect you against the same infection again, is historically we've actually just give, exposed people to the same virus again and see if they get the infection. So that's something we don't totally want to do with this particular virus because the mortality rate is higher. Um, so what we're going to have to do is just watch closely, watch the patients that we know have a positive antibody test and look to see if there is a possibility of reinfection because that is still very much a question mark for the medical community. And we have some information coming out of South Korea right now where they've had patients who tested negative positive, then negative, and then positive again later. So we don't know if that's they're getting the infection again. Is it the testing that was problematic? 
Um, so that's a really great question that we don't totally know the answer for yet. Thank you so much for that answer. And uh, thank you for your question, Lynn. Great question. Thanks for asking it. We've got this one coming from Eleanor in Allentown who asked me to read it for her. She wants to know, I was denied unemployment and I don't know why. Can you help me? Who'd like to take that one from Eleanor in Allentown? Well, I'm hoping Susan Dickinson will help will take that or our or secretary uh or the secretary will. Well, I'll give the uh, easy part of the answer. Yes, we can help her, uh but I'll uh, leave the rest of that to Susan. Correct. So, depending on the reason of the denial, of course, I I won't know at this very moment um uh, since it's not a lot of information, but uh, there is an appeal process. So if it was the fact that you didn't have enough wages and there were wages missing, you can appeal that to our referees. Um, there are appeal instructions in the determination you received. And our referees actually are holding hearings right now. Um, they're all completely by telephone, uh, but they they are you know proceeding with their, their hearings as usual. Um, so the the best way to file an appeal, if you have online access, you can do it on our website. There's a web form. You just fill in the form and hit submit, and you can can appeal your determination. Um, and that would probably be the easiest way. If if you do um, only have telephone um, on the determination, there is an address there to mail your appeal to the office. So you can mail it to the office. We don't have a lot of people physically in the office because we're socially dis distancing, but there are people there every day to make sure we get the mail and get things processed. Perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate that answer. And uh, thank you so much for the question. Thanks for submitting that, Elizabeth. Uh, Rick's asked me to read his next question as well, and I'll go, that, go ahead and do that for him. He's also in Allentown, and he wants to know, is there an application process for the $600 unemployment benefit that is separate from the state application process? Congresswoman Wild? I believe there is not, but I think the people on the phone who deal with unemployment can um, tell us better, but I'm quite certain that there is not. Susan, can you answer that? You are correct. There is not a separate application. So when you file for your regular benefits, or let's say you're someone who will be starting PUA benefits in a few weeks, we just make that $600 payment on top of whatever else we're paying you at the time, whichever program it is. Got it. Perfect. Thank you, Rick, for the question. Thanks for the answer. Let's keep trucking through these questions. We've got Elizabeth in Allentown next. Elizabeth, you're live. Go ahead with your question. Thanks for waiting. <laughs> Okay, thank you for having this opportunity to ask you a question. I have a small business. Um, a lot of my neighbors, I live on Gordon Street. I happen to be white. We've got all kind of colors here, all kind of ethnic groups. Lots of people are have these really, really small businesses, and we need the money that uh, the government is offering because otherwise we have no money, you know, through this transition. We want to take money and invest it into making the change that we need to to do to make our business viable uh, uh, for the next year or two, and if that's our income. We got all these people getting um, unemployment and all these other things, and the Democrats are, are fighting and getting in the way of this new monies to come to little businesses like mine and my neighbors. So I want to know, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm pretty sure that question is for me, so I'm going to take it. This is Congresswoman Wild. And let me first say that um, I, I'm sorry for the, what you are going through. I, I do want to um, I want to correct the misunderstanding that Democrats are standing in the way of small businesses getting their funding, especially Democrats in the House of Representatives. Let me tell you that I have not yet. Um, it, we know that the first CARES Act passed with a very substantial amount of money that was supposed to be intended for small businesses, and some small businesses were able to receive that money. Unfortunately, I don't think that enough were. And I am literally waiting to be called for a vote on additional funding for small businesses. I think it is essential that we get money to them as quickly as possible, because I view small businesses as being in the same category of the people who want to, who need to collect unemployment, because most of the small businesses in our district 
are family or individually owned. They are people who have invested their life savings into those small businesses and really need relief right now. So, But it is also very, very important that our response to this crisis be bipartisan. I am completely on board with additional funding for our small businesses. I talk to the small business community every single day. I talk to our community banks who will who are assisting with the funding of the PPP and so forth. Um, I'm not in the United States Senate. I'm in the House of Representatives. I haven't yet had the ability to vote to support more funding for the SBA and the PPP programs or anything else that would benefit small businesses. I voted in the affirmative for the original round, and I'm committed to doing so again as soon as we are called for a vote on this issue that adequately supports our business community and all of the people that they serve. Um, I know that today, um, I guess today's April 16th, I'm losing track of the days, but I think it was today that the Small Business Administration announced that they have run out of funding for the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and it is incredibly important to me that we refund that, um, meaning re add additional funding to that program um, as quickly as possible. Just, I, I, and the last thing I want to add is that what you may have been hearing is that um, there are a number of Democrats, including myself, who feel that it's very important that we also provide additional money for our hospitals and our emergency responders. And we have been negotiating to include that as part of the small business funding deal. So I hope that that answers your question. I am very much on board with that, and I agree with you that that is essential. Yeah, thank you so much, Congresswoman. Appreciate the answer. And thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for the question and for advocating for your community. Appreciate you very much. We're going to get to our next question from Glenn in just a moment here. But a quick reminder, if you'd like to get email updates from Congresswoman Wild's office, now's, the chance, now's your chance to push seven. We've got a little bit less than 20 minutes left in this live teletown hall. And uh, we'd like to get your email address before we get to the close. So if you haven't already pressed seven to give us your email address to get updates, we'd love to keep you better updated moving forward with accurate, updated information. Best way to do that is to give us your email address. So go ahead and press seven right now to give us your email and we'll keep you better updated moving forward. We're gonna get our next question right away from Glenn. Hey Glenn, you're live. Go ahead, please, sir. Hey, this is a two part question very quickly. I think the secretary explained it in the unemployment. Uh, on the PUA, for, I'm a real estate agent. I'm an independent contractor. When are those applications going to be on the unemployment site for us to fill out? And I'll, I'll start, and then, Susan, you can jump in. We are uh, finishing up the testing that we need to do now. We are hoping uh, to have them up early next week for the application. And then uh, what, Monday or Tuesday? or uh, That's our hope. Uh, that, that's the plan as, as we test it. Uh, the technology gods will... Uh, if they're with us, that's that's where we'll be. Susan, I don't know if you have an update. Is it a separate website? It, no, it's not a separate website. You would go to uc.pa.gov. And, okay. Um, and I'm, Susan, I, you jump in here because I want to make sure I'm giving you the right information. I know it's it's not a separate website. You go to ours, and there's a link. Is that correct? Correct. We're going to have a link there. We're also going to put side-by-side -side information to help people understand whether or not they should be clicking on the regular UC button or they should be clicking on the PUA button. Um, so we're gonna spell that out a little bit. Of course, individuals who are self-employed, that's a, a no-brainer as they say, you know you have to click on the, the PUA one, but there's some other situations where people might not be sure. Um, so we're gonna provide some clarification and the link will be available. Um, and as I said earlier, the, when we put up the link, it's really gonna just take your initial application and then the application is actually going to be processed and you'll be contacted to start filing for weeks, probably a few weeks later. Question is for Representative Wild. Uh, Representative Wild, uh, appreciate you taking the calls tonight. The Being a realtor, there's a lot of misinformation here from uh, in the past few weeks about whether or not we can show houses or we can't show houses. The actual 
truth is, no, you can't show a vacant house. No, you can't show any house. No, we're supposed to follow the rules also. But there's companies out here who are advertising on the radio. They're showing houses. So what's being addressed to kind of make sure the mandates are followed? Well, thank you for that question. Um, this is Representative Wild, and I will tell you that the guidelines about which businesses are essential and non-essential is actually not made at the federal level. It's made at the state level. And I, ha I do ha count among my group of acquaintances and friends a number of realtors who have expressed to me concerns, uh, more than concerns, uh, dismay about the fact that they haven't been able to even do a virtual showing of a home. Um, I understand that perhaps that is allowed in New Jersey. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, but that is literally an issue that is dealt with at the state level. I'm not aware of anybody who's advertising that they can show homes. Uh, I, I'm sure that that's true, as you mentioned it, but um, that sounds like something, if you're hearing that kind of advertising, it sounds like something that should be reported to our state attorney general. Um, and I'm, tr I'm grasping here to remember what his website is, but um, if, if it's not allowed, then um, it, it cert nobody should be doing it. Got it. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, and I uh, appreciate that question. Thank you, both of your questions. Thanks so much, Glenn. And I'm going to get us right to our next question. This one's coming from Ron. Ron in Stroudsburg, you're live. Um, oh, it looks like Ron wants me to read his question. Sorry about that. So he's wanting to know, if I am going out to get some fresh air, but executing the six-foot distance, do I still need to wear a mask? And that one's from Ron. Who'd like that one? Sounds like a question for Dr. Slinker. I was just going to say that. I think that's me. Um, so, technic so the most important thing to remember is that the social distancing and the six-foot rule, that is what we need to be following. The masking is so that you do not transmit potential virus when you're during a short period before you have symptoms, which we call an asymptomatic period, where you can shed the virus for other people. But it's really difficult to get a droplet of that virus on someone if you're six feet away from them. So I would say the answer is you probably don't need to wear a mask, but I think if you're not out there running or, you know, doing some form of physical exercise where it's really difficult to wear the mask, I think it's a nice showing to wear the mask just in solidarity with your community to show everybody that you're following the rules. We want to protect our community as best we can. Thanks. Great answer. Appreciate it, doctor. Thank you for your question, Ron. And uh, real quick for our last question, that question you asked, Glenn, the State Attorney General's Office for Pennsylvania is attorneygeneral.gov. Must have gotten in there early and bought that domain name before anybody else got to it. So it's just attorneygeneral.gov. Thank you. Sure thing. And our next question is going to come here from Robin. Hey, Robin, you're live. Go ahead. Hi, yes. I wanted to ask Congressman Wild. I know that Senator Casey asked the federal government to expand the SNAP program so that EBT benefits could be on, used online for uh, grocery delivery. I'm wondering if she has any information about how that might be progressing and if there are similar efforts in the House of Representatives to support this. So, um, Robin, I'm also wondering. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, Robin, I'm really happy that you asked that question. That, came, that issue came to my attention very early on, and um, there is no reason that somebody who receives SNAP benefits should not be eligible for the same kind of delivery services that other people um, partake of in terms of getting their food delivered. Many, many people are reluctant to go to grocery stores because of the stay at home order. We're actually discouraged from going to grocery stores except when we absolutely need to. So I have signed on to legislation that would in fact allow SNAP uh, recipients to receive delivery services along with everybody else. And um, I've been on that now for several weeks. Um, I can't tell you exactly whether how it's progressed. I know 
that it has not yet um, received enough co-signers for it to make it to get its own vote, but it may very well be incorporated into a, a an additional um, stimulus package going forward. And I hope that it does because it is as important. It's important for every single person to have as little outside contact as possible right now while we try to flatten this curve. Thank, Thank you so much. And Robin, you said you had a second question you wanted to ask. Uh, yes, actually, thank you. It, it kind of dovetails with the first. Um, unfortunately, my car broke down at the exact wrong time, and I live in a place where I cannot access public, what little tra public transportation there is because I live too far away from the routes. You know, even if I wasn't too scared to utilize such services, um, I'm basically stuck in my house. I can't use grocery delivery. Are, are there any thoughts or programs to help people just get food if they can't get out? Well, it depends on the circumstances, Robin. Um, first of all, I don't know from your question whether you are eligible or if you're on a Lanta bus route. I know that Lanta, our local um, public transportation service, is doing its absolute best to serve as many people in the community as possible. Um, if you're on a Lanta route, um, they are still running. Uh, the, uh, masks are not required by the government, gov governor's order, but are certainly recommended if you have access to one. Um, beyond that, um, it would be a matter of either getting delivery by, uh, by um, paying for it or having um, this bill that I've just suggested that I signed on to um, pass. And um, I am incredibly worried about people like you and your family and others around our district who are food insecure. And um, I know that there has been an overwhelming demand on our uh, food banks, even for those people who have the transportation to get to them. And I'm happy to say, even though it's not yet enough, that the First Cares Act did greatly supplement um, nutrition assistance um, in terms of funding. And we've got to continue to do that going forward because that, of course, is everyone's first priority. And those people who have access um, to food and nutrition without uh, any difficulty, uh, frankly, take it for granted. But it, it once, once somebody is food insecure, it really is um, your top priority. And I, I fully understand that and will continue to work going forward to make sure that all people are able to access nutrition. If I could add Thank something, so Congressman, could I add to that, please? Please, please do. Yes, uh, I hope if you have access to the internet, Robin, if, uh, if you go to the governor's homepage, governor.pa.gov, that's governor.pa.gov, uh, it comes up on information related to COVID-19 and if you click on learn more, that will take you to a, a section where you can get information. Uh, you would click on four individuals after that. You just follow those links. And there's a lot of information in there, one whole section on food assistance. Uh, so that may be a, a place uh, that you can get some information that would be helpful for you. That's governor.ca.gov, learn more, four individuals, and you'll, you'll get there. Yeah. And the other thing that, that I would like to add to that answer, um, for if you're if you're not uh, if you don't have the uh, availability of internet, or you have any other problems that haven't been addressed during this um, telephone town hall, my office, aside from being available at wild.house.gov, has a telephone number of four eight four seven eight one six thousand four eight four seven eight one six thousand. I encourage people on this call and otherwise to reach out to us with your questions and to ask exactly the kinds of questions that Robin just asked. We will do our absolute best to link you up with local and state resources that will assist you in whatever issue you might have. Thank you again, Congresswoman, and thank you, Jerry. Great answers. Thanks so much for your question. Appreciate you, Robin. We've got Pam coming up live next. Pam, looks like you got a couple of questions. Go ahead. 
Yeah, hi, I'm from Emmaus, and I uh, just had a question about the uh, PUA. I um, did apply on the regular website, and I understand from the federal government that there has to be a separate website for that. I think that it was addressed in one of the previous questions. I know you said soon. I don't know just how long soon is, but you're saying maybe next week we can apply, and then it would be several more weeks. I did apply five weeks ago have not heard back from the regular website so then i was told that that's the wrong website so it is the same website it's just a different portion of it that that's correct and uh you're right if you had applied before we had the guidelines and were you know have this system set up you would have been the system would have uh denied your claim because that's not set up for this particular uh federal program so we are uh, and i would have heard about that through a letter because I didn't get anything back. I didn't get a pin or a letter that say, said it was denied. I got nothing back. I don't know. Susan, can you speak to that? Yes. Um, I'm going to guess that you're probably one of the individuals, um, if you were self-employed and you had your business address the same as your home address, it stops the claim. Um, so that's probably why you didn't receive anything because it's, it's just waiting to be like pushed through the system. And that's, that's typical if um, we do have a lot of those because of, of self-employed people trying to apply for um, benefits. And of course that's not available yet, but it will be soon. Um, so once we think that, you know, the system is tested and it works well and we're gonna launch it, at that same time, we're also going to reach out to anyone who was denied um, and send you a letter and say, hey, PUA is available, please come, you know, file your claim. If you've already filed, you've been denied, you want to come over here. So what we're going to do, anyone who supplied us with an email address, we're going to email that. But for individuals who did not give us an email address, we're going to send a paper letter through the mail. Perfect. Thanks for the answers again. Thank you, Pam, for your questions. We're going to get our next one up from Ed in Schnecktville. Go ahead, Ed. Thanks for waiting. You're up. Uh, yes, my question has to do with signing up for the direct deposit for the $1,200 check. Um, we were told yesterday it was going to be good to go, and I'm just wondering what, where do I fill it out? I'm looking at the IRS website, and at the top it has an area for non-filers to enter their payment info. Is that the one I use, or is there something different for somebody like myself um, I'm self-employed, and I've never signed up for direct deposit. Thank you. Are you? Are you? I assume you're not a non-filer, meaning you you do file tax returns, Ed. Correct. Yes. I uh, just being self-employed, I pay quarterly, Ed, so I've never signed up for the direct deposit before. Okay. Um, I am going to the Internal Revenue Service website right now. Um, because I have, I've actually not walked through this myself, and this is Representative Wild addressing you. Um, if so, you haven't ever received or paid directly to the IRS uh, online, correct? No, I always send in quarterly checks. Okay. Um, all right. If you could do me a favor and give us your information, um, you can actually, I know that there's a portal on the IRS. I'm not sure that it's live yet where you can submit a form with your bank information to the IRS, but I'm looking at the website and I don't see that portal here yet. Um, so may I suggest that you provide us with your information by pressing seven, um, remind us that you um, asked this question so that we know that, that that's you, and we will get back to you on that. Somebody uh, from my office will definitely get back to you on that as soon as we know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Although what I'll do I, is I'll send you. Yeah, the other thing that I think you might do, you, what you might try to expedite things is to go to the non-filers um, link and actually fill that out as though you're a non-filer. And right, I could do that. Fails. I just no, no, I I got that and I can do that. I just wanted to make sure I didn't do something that I shouldn't have done. 
and that causes no, I don't think delay. So. No, I don't. Th- I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's a good place to put in your information. Okay, so should I not contact your office then? Go Tell ahead me. and do that as well. Let's let's do both so that we make sure that you get yours as quickly as possible. All righty. And Ed, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you back into the listening audience, and as soon as you're you finish hearing the prompt that plays as you go back into listen mode, press seven and speak to one of our operators, and just give them the best contact information for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we'll thank have you, somebody Ed. get back to you as quickly as possible. Thank you, Congresswoman. We've got one here from Christopher in Bethlehem. Go ahead, Chris. Hello. How, how is everybody? I hope everybody's well. Um, I've been having uh, issues with uh, unemployment. Um, I worked at the casino and it shut down back in March and I put an initial claim in and they had told me that the, uh, that the, I guess the base year, um, it was back in 2018 and I didn't have enough credit to file again on the 5th, which I did of April because then the base year switched over and um, I still haven't heard anything back. And I know on the claim that I got, uh, I'm, I'm waiting on a pin for it. Am I supposed to be waiting on a pin for a new claim? Because uh, I'm supposed to file this Sunday. Um, is my other claim is still open. I'm just real confused because I can't get a hold of anybody. And it's really, really rough. Sure, this is Susan. Um, what might be happening... Um, I- Assuming that, I, I don't know if the information that you received before about the base year, um, if they said they looked and calculated it and for sure you would be eligible. So uh, without getting into all the weeds about base years and calculations, um, if you were eligible as of the new filing, that should have generated a PIN and it should be there soon. Usually we say they take about five to ten days. So you're right there. If it was the fifth, you're right on that cusp. Um, if it turns out that you actually don't have enough base year wages and you don't qualify financially, you will qualify for the PUA program. So my advice uh, would be just to wait a couple more days and see if you have your PIN. We've been telling people that, that if the PIN arrives late, you're still going to be able to file for those older weeks. Um, it's not going to get shut off. We know that it's taking a while to mail PINs and for people to receive them. So you should just wait for the PIN to arrive, and then you can start filing. Um, And if it it doesn't arrive, um, as long as there was no issues such as, like, the Social Security identification issues, it's amazing how many people do, you know, reverse numbers and things and don't even realize it. Um, And then they're surprised when we contact them (laughs) and tell them that that happened. Uh, So... Anyway, they, um, you'll get your PIN and you can file, but if you don't, there is a chance maybe you are not eligible and you will be able to file for the other program. So if you don't hear anything at all within the next couple days, probably by like, say, mid, mid next week, Wednesday, um, then you could try to contact our office either by sending an email um, or you could try calling the office. Uh, as I said, Thursday and Friday are the better days to call. Um, because you'll not be able to get through probably very well on Mondays or Tuesdays. The claim it still says that it's being oh, – I'm sorry. Um, you guys have a great day. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Congresswoman, excuse me. This is this is Jerry. I, I hate to do this, but I'm, I have uh, a, another call, uh, town hall at 820. So uh, I'm going to uh, get going. I do want to thank you for the opportunity, and I hope you found this helpful. Secretary, I, I certainly did, and I hope our listeners did, and thank you so much for participating. Thank you. We've all got a lot of commitments these days. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And, Congresswoman, we went a little over our hour schedule just to get a few more questions right. in there, but uh, we are ready to wrap up, so I'll toss it over back to you if you want to uh, take us to the close here. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Thank you, Ian, for moderating. Um, I do hope this was helpful. These kinds of things always seem to go way too fast, and there are so many questions that I know that people have. Um, I really encourage people to visit our website at wild.house.gov and submit an email question. Um, my, My team is working every single day 
um, many, many hours a day to answer your questions as, as well as with a lot of input from me. And we all want to hear from you. We want to know. And, and if we can't answer your question, we will do our absolute best to get you to the person who can answer your question, just as we tried to do tonight with representatives of the hospital as well as representatives from unemployment. So with that, I want to just say, um, please stay home, stay healthy. This will not last forever. We, we can't rush it, but we really need to make sure that everybody is safe when they go back out there and when they go to work and I think that everybody needs to work together and understand that this is a difficult time for all of us. Um, and we are here for you, and we really, really appreciate you participating in this town hall. Thank you.